At the time, I just thought it was hilarious. And then, like, later I thought about it, like, no, I actually kind of get that. Like, mm-hmm. you get to a point, don't you think? Like, mm-hmm. you get to a point where you're like, you know, this is so awful. Like, mm-hmm. this is so bad that it's actually getting to a point where you think, like, you know what? I need to actually change my view of what's beautiful or what's uh, what I like. Hi. Hello. 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 Hello, and welcome to Architecting. Hi, I'm Rebecca Wagner. Nope, nope. (laughs) Hi, welcome to Architecting. I'm Rebecca Wagner, here with the host, Adam Wagner. Hey, Adam, who's on the podcast today? So today on the show, we have somebody um, who I'd say is pretty special. He was the first person that I reached out to when we moved here. And a person who's more visible on the on the national stage than just in Colorado. He just curated the American Pavilion for the uh, Venice Biennale. He teaches at UIC in Chicago, and he's just a an intense, smart guy uh, and somebody who I I really think of as a friend and somebody I look up to. So this guy, he 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 texted me five minutes before we were going to start the podcast and said that we should start off with a, a light debate about the top five buildings in, in Colorado. Uh, and then we really dove into the meaning of what good is or good with an architecture. And uh, I'll tell you what, this, I'm sorry, but this episode is long. Uh, I need to, to really hire a real editor and stop editing this myself because I think everything is interesting and it was really hard to cut anything out. Uh, and so we talked for almost two hours and we pretty much just hung on until my computer, my computer died. So check out the bonus material after the interview, but only if you really care about architecture, because we, we get into it. But for me, it was just a really fun conversation with somebody that, uh, I really enjoy talking to and don't get to talk to as, as much and, and have some good stories. And you know, he, he dives into um, stories about his time in L.A. with Greg Lynn, with uh, talking about Tom Main. We swap uh, best review stories where he does a Peter Cook impression. Um, talk about drinking too much at architecture conferences. And then we, we really end, we book in the whole conversation again with talking about about good architecture and, and what that what that means to to both of us and especially to him. What do you think? Paul Anderson. Definitely Paul Anderson. Oh yeah, I forgot his name. Paul Anderson. That's who we're talking with. The one and only Paul Anderson of Independent Architecture. Can't wait to hear it. Check it out. Hey, so in this ever changing design landscape I'm finding that it's increasingly important to learn how to best leverage new tools and technologies to push the design process and create better architecture. Today we have Pax from Medium Labs, Ryan Gould from Sofer Sparn Architects, and Tom Klingenberg from Sierra Pacific Windows to talk about a new way that Sierra Pacific is integrating their products with how architects work. What do you have going on, guys? Yeah, at uh, Sierra Pacific, we recognize that VR could be a great tool for us to help our customers experience products that uh, are not easily accessible and also that are kind of a significant uh, investment for them to make. And we've, we've discovered over and over again that it's difficult for clients to make all of the choices that are available. But if we can give them something that they can see in real time, it should help make those choices easier. Yeah, and, and Medium Labs creates VR apps for companies. And this was unique because some of these doors and windows, you, they can't really be seen in real life, like in a showroom. So that was kind of what we did is we designed the ultimate showroom for architects and for home builders to see how these doors work. And they could really open the doors. It feels like you're there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and from the architect side, Tom brought us in as a, as an early preview to their app, um, and we got really excited about being able to uh, integrate our house models into a VR headset 
um, to allow our clients to really immerse themselves in uh, their potential future home and kind of look around and make design selections, make kind of design adjustments. It, it's also really interesting when you think about how we spend a lot of time designing on screens. We might be flying around a 3D model, but we're still ultimately in a 2D environment. And so even just for the design process in, inside of our own firms as architects, um, VR can be a really useful tool for immersing yourself in that 3D environment, really getting a sense for the volume of the space. Yeah, so Tom, how do we try this out? Uh, I have a headset and am willing to travel and can travel to different firms or offices. We also have a headset at our Denver showroom. Great. The link for this will be in the bio on Instagram. And they also have a live demonstration coming up at Denver Design Week, Friday, October 22nd from 3.30 to 8.30 at Sofer Sparn's office at 3300 Walnut in Denver. Sign up for the event at denverdesignweek.com or go to sierrapacificwindows.com for more information. Cool, guys. Looking forward to checking it out. Thanks, Thanks. Adam. Yeah. See you there. Hey, so our goal at Architecting is to strengthen the community of Colorado designers, and nobody is doing this better already than Modern in Denver. So Modern in Denver has been striving to bring designers together and to bring people to good design for a long time now. We're excited to be working together with them on this shared goal. For over a decade, they've been crafting fantastically curated and designed content on Colorado designers and projects. So go out now, buy a copy of their newest issue at your local bookstand, subscribe to their weekly email list, and follow them on Instagram. How's it nice. going, man? Uh, it's good. How are you? Good. Yeah. Good seeing you. It's been it's been a while. Not really. I saw you at a uh, cabinet. <laughs> That's true. That was like two weeks ago. It it just two weeks feels like such a long time not to see Actually, you. Actually, it's probably more than two weeks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cool. What have you been up to? What have I been up to? Um, I don't know. Like it's. Uh, you know, I don't know. Been busy, like teaching, fair bit of teaching. Yeah, yeah, which is good. Like I've, I've really, so far, it's been a good semester. What's your What's your semester like? I know, I know, you have some semesters where you uh, are there more often than in Chicago, and then some where you're here more often. Are yeah. You, so this, how often are you this there? year, I'm doing all of my teaching in one semester. So. I, every year, I, I only teach two classes. I teach a seminar and a studio. Mm. Some years, it's um, they're connected, so I do like the seminar in the fall, and then I have the same students in the studio in the spring, and it's their version of a thesis. So it's there, it's our version of a thesis. I, you know, I am part of the school. Yeah. Um, How long have you been there? You've been there uh, long enough a while, to say like ten yeah. years or something. Nine years, maybe. I don't know. It's either eight or either nine or eleven. I don't. I can't remember. <laughs> Let's go with nine. Yeah, nine. It's a long time. So All this right. this semester you're teaching both of those classes, and yeah, but they're so they're not connected now. It's not. It's a different thing. So I just teach an option studio, a graduate option studio, and a seminar hmm. that are not related. When when did you get back from Italy? Is that recent? Um, I was there last week. Oh, really? But yeah. But I've been there off and on. Um, yeah, I was there in April, twice in May. No, I take that back. Just for one long trip in May. And then the, we went there as a family in July. Hmm. And then I went back in August and September for um, like programming stuff that stuff that couldn't happen at the opening because people couldn't be there and stuff hmm. like that. So there've been like this year because it was like limited at the opening, one of the silver linings is that people have organized these other weekends that where a lot of curators or commissioners or speakers have, have gone back. And so it's been kind of nice to like keep going back and 
you know, meeting new people each time and seeing and seeing some of the same people every time. Yeah. And, you know, like, like, you know, getting tours of different things. Like, I, I feel like I've seen more of the exhibition than I would have if, if it was just like a blockbuster opening and then really nothing for the rest of the run. Mm-hmm. So, so that part's been really good. Yeah, that's cool. I've, I've, I've been to, I think, two of the Biennale's, but yeah, just for one day. And it's like, it's just like a fire hose of architecture that you try to take in and then, yeah. and to be able to spread that out and uh, interact more with people. Yeah. Sounds yeah. better. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, cool. You know, I haven't had a, um, look at that microphone. You like that? I didn't notice that at first. Yeah. That thing is like, uh, like, it's like you're a conservative talk show host with that, to be honest. It looks like a Rush Limbaugh show. Why does it have to be conservative? I mean, aside There's... from the background, I, just because I've never seen a liberal talk show host. Like, can you name one? Well, if you if you say, like, podcast, there's a bunch of liberal podcasts. I mean, it doesn't have Probably, to be. Probably, but I'm thinking, like, the, you know, mm. like, where you see them on TV mm. at 2 in the afternoon. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that took, took it a different place. I yeah. mean, of course, there are other, there are, you know liberal and progressive news programs, but I don't, I can't, you know, I don't, yeah. Hmm. Maybe like a Ira Glass or something, you know? You think he has a microphone like that? I bet so. Or do you think, you think liberals like have it from the bottom up and conservatives maybe top down? (laughs) That that makes sense uh, from a political point of view, right? Top down. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Well, but what I was going to say... They're both, they're both kind of top down. <laughs> yeah, but, that's true. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, I've never had a, a guest make a make a request about um, how we start the show before with with a, with a light debate. Uh, I was just thinking, like, I think it's kind of, I don't know, I would think it would be kind of fun to, um, at least for a moment, talk about something other than ourselves yeah i think it's for cool. at least for a couple i i i uh i did not prepare for that debate at all so yeah, n- i'll need a few minutes okay that's good like a because top five or something because that's how i felt I, I thought you were i almost didn't know if you were making a joke be, no no, saying, no like I'm like, like, joke, like right? 10 minutes before and you're saying hey can we have a light debate about the top five architects to work in colorado <laughs> no i just meant like if we, could, if we, we should quickly come up with like lists hmm. yeah mm-hmm. I don't think top five call current or past Colorado architects. I, I'm not, I don't know enough to take that one on. Mm-hmm. But it could be nice to do like top five buildings or yeah. something like that. What, what makes a good building for you? Are we recording this? Yeah, it's Go all on. recorded. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I thought this was all bonus material. Oh uh, no, which is great. The I don't even edit. So this is material. this is all gonna be put out. This is how it goes. You don't edit. Okay. It takes way thanks, too much thanks time. for the heads up, by the way, that we were uh <laughs> this is official. No, I'll, okay. I'll, I can cut uh, some of this out, but No, well, well we should do whatever you want. It's, it's your show. Um What makes a good building? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's different for everyone, right? I mean, that's kind of like, I, I, I mean, for me, I guess I like buildings that surprise me, I guess, mm. you know, or, or make me like question how I see the world or how I see architecture. Mm. Got real serious once I realized that we were <laughs> officially running. I should I, I shouldn't have told you that. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, no, I mean that's I think that's uh but I you know, I think I've been like I think I've been thinking about that a lot lately. You know, it's like the further I get along in architecture, the less I feel like I know or, or like that the word good is just uh so difficult for me of of what is good, you know, and I think for me it's it's sort of about like a read a real a clear readability and like conceptually and and understanding s- someone has a clear understanding of what they're doing and 
and Mm -hmm. then like that's step one and then and then there's an element of like talking about their time or context and then a surprise is something Mm -hmm. is like the cherry on the top maybe or or this or the surprise or like a twist is is somewhere in there um so you like buildings that are contemporary you like they're they're of their time and or or that there's there they know if they're of their time or not like they they understand yeah. their place within the uh-huh. time of yeah uh, within like the discourse of the time i'd say you know yeah yeah i mean it's it's a, even that like the 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 timeliness i guess of projects is a pretty that's a pretty interesting, I, I think people have very strong opinions about that. You know, I think there's some people who would argue that architecture should be timeless, you know, it should be, that they're like universal, um, I don't know, like merits and, and flaws in architecture. And, um, you know, that the best architecture is kind of always been the same for centuries and will always be the same versus the view that it's a reflection like fashion or something like that it's a it's a clear reflection of its time and of the issues of its time Mm -hmm. um and actually you know that like the word good is is a word that makes me a little uneasy for that reason yeah because a lot of times it's a you know it's a more like a moralistic judgment like if you do a certain kind of work, it's good. If you do a, a different kind of work, it's bad. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. The, and um, I don't know. I don't like, I bristle at the moralism. That mm-hmm. it makes me feel really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So I guess good, by good, I, you know, I was taking it more, gen- not to mean that, but to mean more like, just what do I appreciate or what does yeah. somebody else appreciate? So what, what, what hits some of those, what, what, which buildings hit on your list then? We're going Colorado. Let's do Colorado. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think the Air Force Academy is top of the list for Mm -hmm. me. Um, I would then, uh, there's a genre kind of of buildings that I really like in Colorado, which is, um, 50s and 60s small suburban houses Hmm. so like the kind of houses that you would find um in Englewood uh say south east of Broadway and Hamden so kind of south of Englewood High School there's like a neighborhood there it's not the only one but there's a neighborhood there there are actually a bunch of these neighborhoods some are some are farther north you know, like up around Lowry, some are a little more west, like in, in Lakewood and in Littleton. But there was a, I think there was an era, it must have been after World War II, where, where developers were trying to make the houses look unique. And they were just trying all kinds of different things, like quick, easy things, like the address being enormous hmm. on a small house or, you know, some, you know, weird little tiny gable over the front door or, uh, just some some of it's also things that people have done themselves afterwards like you'll find that houses with tons of bird houses and fences just um attached to the facade you know it's just a odd collection of miniature fences and bird houses or something you know it's really <laughs> weird stuff but very yeah like stuff that doesn't follow any of the like written or unwritten rules of design that we have like not in kind of you know just your standard suburban house building that we have these days not in schools and the things we talk about there like there's nowhere where anybody is like you know dealing with those kinds of things so i like that stuff too and i mean you you've been studying that with seminars and with with classes and with sort of with like the mother house and a little bit with the biennial like this sort of like abnormalities within sort of residential form in a way right i mean yeah i like that stuff yeah i think it's interesting i think it's yeah for a lot of reasons i mean i think it's great because it does 
very directly breaks a lot of rules. So it's uh, kind of nice to to look at things that are, you know, not they're, they're sort of unpredictable, I guess. By you know, and within the you take them out of their context and bring them into say a school like you know UIC or something like that, and all of a sudden they're it's like wild, you know, cre- like you know, unpredictable stuff. Um, I also like it because it's kind of, it's anti elitist, you know, mm-hmm. it's like looking at, at the, at the, you know, not super expensive, you know, high architecture kinds of things, but it's looking at the stuff that is around us all the time, and, you know, it's a lot more, um, I guess ordinary, you know, that, and, and I, and I, I love looking at that for that reason too, because I also think that there, it's, possible to do really interesting work it doesn't it doesn't have to be like big budget projects and art museums and things like that mm-hmm. although if anybody listening wants to hire us to do an art museum I'm way into that yeah <laughs> that'd be great yeah you call me first and then call paul and yeah, yeah. uh no but i mean seriously like I, I think you can do a lot of good by choosing your clients too you know i mean i think that's like that's a, you know, it's, it's a big thing these days, like how we can be a little more equitable and, you know, how in, in our, in American society in general. And I think, you know, there are different ways architecture can do that. And one of the best ways, in my opinion, is to choose who you work with and who you work for along those lines too. Like, I think it's really good to do work for people who, you know, could use your help, but maybe don't have a ton of money to hire, you know, architects to do work for them or something like that. So. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we try to do that. Kind of sort of going back to your your good architecture in a way that makes you bristle. I guess so. Yeah, I mean, but, so like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Like it's it's like I guess I don't believe in the moralism when it comes to design, but I do believe in the moralism when it comes to like how you are in the world as a business person or as a um, yeah, just you know a person. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, you know, I think I think you know. I believe in being a good person, but I, but I think when it comes to design, because I also am not so sure that design can do as much for those causes as people sometimes think it can. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we have plenty of examples of that, of kind of false hope in architecture's ability to, you know, solve a housing problem or um, deal with racial inequality or something like that. And then it, it failed. Mm-hmm. Um, so because we kind of expected too much of it, but um, yeah, sort of having a uh, like realistic understanding of architecture's power or or yeah. of what you can what you can do. I mean, I think you know, I just started a firm a few months ago, and like I'm running into that a lot of just you know the projects that are coming in are like people who know me through my dad or something, right? It's not because they want my sort of design or you know, and then the budgets right. are normally pretty small and, and, you know, yes, I want to help people that have small budgets, but I also want to take yeah. a lot, lot of time to design something yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so there's like three rubs there that don't, that don't yeah. match up. Uh, so how have you figured that out? Give me the answer. Well, I'm told that eventually you will get paid for doing that extra <laughs> yeah. work because well. it'll become clear that that's valuable to a client and so then they will be willing to pay for that but um so far not so much so far not so much but um yeah so yeah that's like you know work you do for free because you like what you do i think or at least i shouldn't say you i that's work i do for free because i like what i do yeah all right what what are what are some of the other ones you got back to the list um Okay, back to that list. All right, let's see. Uh, the old um, Colorado Historical Society building, which was a kind of, it's not there anymore. It was torn down along with the with a courthouse that was next to it. But it was a very Dutch modern building. It was kind of ramped on one side. Um, and then the courthouse next to it was on these two, like, chunky feet. <laughs> um, but there was a pair, it was, it was, they were designed and built as a pair of buildings and they're really great, like really <laughs> super nice modern buildings. 
like like, I like those er, a lot. early OMA style or yes yeah. they look like they could easily be OMA projects yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and they're both really nice like the sloped one had was the, the, if you if you were looking at that elevation of it the sloped side faced the, the courthouse and it was sloped on the edges but in the middle it was terraced and there were like <laughs> you know it was landscaped it was really nice <laughs> it's really good building um, I put that up there. So that's three, right? Three of five. Mm-hmm. I did, yeah, I don't know if I'm going in order, but I like uh, I like that Wells Fargo building, like the Philip Johnson mm. Tower downtown. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly how the that grid that pattern of windows just gets cropped off everywhere. Like mm-hmm. at the top, it just gets sliced by the you know, the arc of mm-hmm. the arcs of the, you know, the geometry on the top, but then also it, it, that's buildings on a hill. So the sidewalk going up alongside next to it just slices off the it windows just, too. Just, yeah. It just it, hits right into the sidewalk. Yeah. There's like, there's yeah. no window frame on the sidewalk or anything. It just seems like it just like cuts right through. I don't know. There's, there's just that, that's a, yeah, it's kind of an unexpected. Yeah. Detail, I guess there, it seems, I don't know. It seems like kind of a nice building. Before I give my last one, because I might have to think about it for a second, like what, where, where are some of yours? Well, I was thinking about it. I was trying to write it down. I, I had had the Air Force Academy, mm-hmm. um, Clifford Still. Yeah. Um, I I'm a big fan of uh, Meridian 105. Do you know them here in town, mm-hmm. Chad Mitchell? So there's a, like the. The building on uh, Tejon, uh, I really enjoy the sort of brick base and then like chopped up kind of top stucco part. And then also their uh, their Jason Street house with the sort of sawtooth top mm-hmm. with stainless steel panels. Um, there's just something really satisfying to me about the, the massing of their work and the ma- kind of simple materials and um, pull it together really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, just Union Station and that, that environment inside, and then especially the, uh, the train station in the back, uh, that, mm-hmm. that space always really yeah. kind of fills me with awe when I'm back there. And then, um, maybe the old source building, I think going in there, uh, mm-hmm. always feels really nice. That's yeah. my five. I, I could see the the Paralympic Museum, but I, ha- I haven't been there yet. So, and I'm also going to Meow Wolf. Yeah, that's a good one. Tomorrow, so there, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, how, how that is too. Yeah. Sorry, where'd you say you're going tomorrow? Meow Wolf. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, that's a nice building from the from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. I throw in an old one, the Mullen Building, hmm. which is. By uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, St. Joe's. Yeah. With a real, you know, like super thick, crusty brick. Yeah. All over red brick. and You know, that's that's actually, I I actually, when you were talking before, that's, I was going to say, I've been really into Temple Buell lately. And there's Mm -hmm. the uh, Trivista, his Trivista school is a few blocks from me. And I really love that. It's the same, like, super articulated brick facade from the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That guy was a madman. Yeah. There's an intensity to it. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, like, really taking the kind of, like, the, the intricacy and, like, ornamentation of brick to... Like really far, you know, like really, really, really building it up thick. It's mm-hmm. great. And and he was so interesting. Like yeah, I, I watched a documentary on him of how he changed. You know, that like after sort of the depression and World War Two, then he got really into the international style and went really modern, and then then developed Cherry Creek Mall. Uh, and, yeah. And which then, is the first mall, right? Which is the yeah, in Colorado. the first mall. I think it was the first, and it's like you know, one of the only malls still around from not even that long ago. Like mm-hmm. 
like 1990 or something. I don't. I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I but I know that there there were a bunch of malls around, but most of them were demolished, and then the ones that we have now are all new. So there's sort of like two generations of malls in Colorado, and Cherry Creek was the first and has stayed all the way through. Yeah, yeah. And that he built up on a dump on a landfill. And Is that what it was? Bought it and just became fabulously rich. Yeah. So why did he shift gears? Do you know? Uh, I think. I think in the documentary they were talking about. It seemed like he was able to do all that brickwork because it was the depression, and so there's a lot of labor. Uh-huh. Uh And then. I think something happened with his own health and he switched to, I mean, maybe just catching on to the, to the trends, you know, at the time. Yeah. Sort of, I mean, 20 years late, but, uh, yeah, I mean, but I think with his brick is really kind of unique, right. To hear and to this time, I mean, outside of sort of like like, late 1800s, like Dutch, brickwork maybe or like you know uh it was pretty unique yeah i mean it's like borderline you know expressionist architecture and you know so it's like the buildings are still more or less rectilinear Mm -hmm. but but they're like you know almost not because just because like the the build-up of that kind of encrusted brick that like almost takes them out of that geometry. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I saw you at the Colorado history museum, I was walking around with Steve Turner, the the director there. And he took me through on the top floor is a whole uh, exhibition about the history of Denver, like architecture and built space. And so he took me all the way through that, and he's a big Temple Buell buff, and so we were talking a lot yeah. about that. But, yeah, everybody should go up to that space and, and really see and feel the history of Denver and Colorado and a lot of great drawings and maps. And uh, Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a good – I mean – it's it's uh, nice to find those histories, you know. Like, mm. it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I don't know if you've, you've listened to any of these interviews, but I I always start off by asking uh, people who they are. But but I think we yeah. just got a good like half an hour. Okay, uh, great. Because I really didn't want to answer that question brain. anyway, to be honest. So then, yeah, I, I didn't think you would. It's a relief. Thank you. You, you know, I um, thanks. You were you were the the first person I reached out to when I, when I moved here and, and, you know, kind of one of the most visible like Denver architects and you graciously got, got coffee with me and talked with me a lot. But when I started this podcast, you were one of the first ones who I wanted to talk to, but I was like, I need to do this for like a year before I get Paul on it. Cause I need to get better at this. Uh, cause uh, I don't know if I can keep up with you. So I had to to practice that, for a while and wow, that makes me sound like really like like I'm not gonna be hard on you. What do you no, not hard, but I, you, I just <laughs> like I gotta. You, you're a you you're an intelligent like, person. Okay. You're a. Oh, uh, I well, gotta. That's nice try to, to say, but yeah, I have to try to talk good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not good at talking either. So um, yeah, I think we just sink into that right and just yeah shoot the shit about whatever yeah but but i but you can't get away from all the questions so where okay. where, where'd you grow up here denver yeah. southeast denver hmm. yeah i grew up near bible park hmm. like yale and quebec roughly what what did your what did your parents do what were you kind of growing up around my Parents were both school teachers. Hmm. Uh, my mom was uh, both public school teachers. My mom was a librarian, and my dad was a math teacher. So uh, hmm. my mom was a DPS, and um, she, uh, you know, worked at a bunch of different uh, schools like J- like Kennedy and and South High, and um, 
also down at their main offices on York Street. And um, my dad uh, taught in the Cherry Creek District, and he spent most of his career, I think, at West Middle School, but then was also at Overland for a while and uh, Creek for a couple of years. And um, yeah, so so they were off in the summers, so we drove around a lot. Hmm. Yeah, we did a lot of car camping and around the Western U.S. and Western Canada. Um, and it was great. It was good. How do you how do you find your way into architecture? Was it a pretty clear choice when you were going off to school, or? Uh, no, I had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated from college. I had, had didn't know. Wait, where where did um, you go to undergrad? I went to school in Philadelphia. I went to Penn. Oh, okay. And then um, came back here and didn't know what I wanted to do. And eventually thought about architecture and I went to work for an office up in Breckenridge for, and lived <laughs> up there for a little while. And what was um, that firm in Breck? Baker, Hogan and Houks. Huh. And, uh, so did you do undergrad architecture? Like, was that your major no, or was it a, I was a history major and a math minor. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You, take, you can't do you, all, you there's just, not a lot of obvious. Uh, you just took on your parents, you know, uh, kind of professions in a way. And... I get, yeah, yeah, I guess kind of, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because my mom, in addition to being a librarian was, uh, uh, at some point taught history, hmm. like ancient history, hmm. classical Greek Roman history. So, so I, it's funny that I, I mean, the math connection I'd made, I guess I'd never really thought about the history one, but yeah, you're right. Hmm. I did. But, you know, when you have a history degree, there's, it's not totally clear what you do with that. So, I mean, you could open a history store, I guess. A history store? You could go buy history? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Start investing in history <laughs> funds. But, um, so I didn't really know. And I thought I might like architecture. And then I went and worked in this office and, and uh, applied to schools and, and frankly got really lucky. I went to UCLA for grad school and, you know, the, the range of schools I applied to seems nuts in retrospect because I had no clue how different the programs were. So I was just applying to schools where I, in cities that I thought I might want to live in or something like hmm. that. And, uh, you know, with no sense at all of what the differences are between different kinds of architecture programs. And luckily I ended up in one that I really enjoyed and it was perfect for me. And, uh, and a good moment to be there. Yeah. So, who, who was, uh, who was there at the time? Like teaching and uh, then also kind of your, uh, contemporaries. Yeah. So, um, the, um, I think the year that I got there, uh, Mark Lee started teaching that mm. and, um, Bob Somo either got there that year or maybe had been there a year, mm. but was new to the, fairly new to the school. Um, I think it was the third year that Sylvia Laban was chair. Greg Lynn was there also. Tom Main was there. Mm. Um, yeah, there were some pretty, and then there were, you know, people coming and going. And, uh, and you didn't have much of a sense when you, when you, like you said, no when clue. you went there, you, nope. you just wanted to land in LA and happened to be there. I mean, once, once I, got into schools, I start, you know, I somehow started to get more of a sense. I asked around and got a little bit more of a sense of the differences between them. So I, was, I chose UCLA pretty deliberately, but, but when I was choosing which ones to apply to, I really, it was like a random list of schools that like, if I'd gotten into the university of Washington, I would have gone there hmm. and the university of Washington is a totally different kind of school than UCLA. Yeah. So, um, Yeah. But I didn't get in there, so I ended up in the yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. And that, and that was great. You know, it was worked out. Lucky. What was your What was some of your biggest takeaways? Like, what What were the things that surprised you there, and that that molded you, or who? I mean, I think the, you know, from the very first day, um, Sylvia was really big on the idea that architecture is a discourse mm. and that it takes many different forms. And that, you know, so, so from the very start, it wasn't like buildings had a higher status than 
drawings or models or gossip or you know essays or you know any of the other forms that architecture takes it was like this is all you know these are all representations of positions on issues um so that was pretty big and that's you know that really i think um appeal it definitely appealed to me and and influenced um and still influences how, how i think about the field of architecture and um you know like what what matters and and how we can be open to like seeing it in different ways and in different places so um yeah that was pretty big and then maybe more specifically um I worked on a project with Greg Lynn called it was embryologic houses, embryological mm. houses, actually. Sorry, I always I always get that wrong. But um the embryological houses, and it was a series of like of these blob houses that he had designed. And he ran a seminar um which was for the 2000 Venice Biennale. He and Hani Rashid mm. presented student work at the 2000 Biennale. <laughs> and um there was this seminar and he gave this presentation of the, of the project. And it was a stunning presentation that I still think about a lot and, and was just brilliant in the way that he understood what he was doing in relation to modern kit of parts variation and how his variation was different from that. And, um, it was so smart and, and, you know, and clear and direct. And, um, and so, uh, so I was in that seminar and, and, and our job in the seminar students, we were in groups and we were designing different um, things to go in or around the houses. So, you know, furniture, things would be inside the houses or landscape features around them or mm -hmm. things like that. So, um, yeah, ways of partitioning them, dividing them up into rooms, like all kinds of stuff. And that was a pretty interesting project. And to be part of the Biennale as a student was a big deal because it kind of, you know, showed that you could participate in all of this. It wasn't like, you know, your thoughts or ideas as a student were not yet worth anything. Like it was, it was like, no, if you're working on stuff that matters and if you've got something to say, you know, people are going to want to hear it. So, um, that was a pretty, yeah, I think in terms of, confidence and ambition that was a big deal for me you know to, to understand that you know you can contribute something and yeah you know, even if you're like a kid from denver and you still wear khakis and flannels which I are you know no, this doesn't translate on a podcast very well but i'm wearing a flannel right, right now <laughs> so it's like yeah i'm still dressing like um, in high school in the 90s but you know and it's kind of getting to be cool again now yeah, a little bit flannel, but, but yeah. it's not bad now but but in around like you know the late 90s early 2000s in la it was not cool at all so um yeah it was kind of nice to do something and realize like you know you could have a voice yeah say something so then wh what where do you go from there i i find that's it's a hard transition of of graduating and especially with with all those experiences and ideas and then like hitting the profession or hit or just being kicked out into the world and figuring out what's next so what was next yeah well so i mean one thing is to not be kicked out into the world mm -hmm. which was I, I went into teaching almost immediately mm -hmm. um and i could do that because uh, a lot of the technology that we had learned as students um, at UCLA was, was, was pretty like at that time, the school was, was really progressive, like very much, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that were happening there that, you know, the, the like CNC milling and all this like fabrication technology, but all, and, and animation software and how you use that for modeling, like all of that stuff was, was being developed at UCLA, but school, other schools in the, you know, maybe five years after I graduated, started to try to bring that in. And so I was really lucky because I graduated and I knew about that. And so then there were other schools who were like, hey, yeah, come mm -hmm. teach that to our students. And and so that was also another bit of luck because it was just timing. Like I just happened to 
go through a certain place at a certain time that gave me some very like clear, specific technical knowledge that other schools were interested in having in their programs. And so, so I could go pretty much like right into teaching. And then, you know, after that, I was hired to do that and kind of got into it and did that for a few years and eventually left a lot of that behind. But, um, where were you teaching? It's, it where, where, did you, where did you land the first? Flow or ease that transition that you were asking. Yeah. About. Where did you go first? Um, Cornell. Cornell. Um, so, and I was there for six years. Mm, and, wow. Uh, it was, um, uh, it was great. It was a um, different place to live, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, there in central New York. Um, but, um, but it was a good place to, at least for me to kind of start figuring out how to step away from what I had learned and try to step toward a, you know, body of work that maybe was going to be a little different from what I'd been taught, but could build on what I'd been taught. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Was that a pretty, natural path i guess i don't know i i think about that a lot of like trying to develop my own sort of project within architecture you know um what to like kill the teacher eventually kill the teacher yeah what's that no but you know what i mean like to or, or not like i mean like you know that you, you you're taught certain things you like them or whatever but eventually yeah i think mm. you have to learn how to say like how to be critical like you could get some distance from that and right say like okay well this, these parts of it were great. I'm going to keep that, but mm -hmm. these other parts, I think I would do differently and for some reason. And yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I don't know if that's typical, but that's definitely how it went for me. Yeah. But I think it's just more, for me, it's more about like, well, what am I about? Right. Like what's the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, coming back around to that, the conversation about elitism or whatever, that was part of the problem I had with it was that it was sort of like, this is like really high tech stuff that, you know, it's like takes a lot. It's very inefficient in terms of time and material, but it's also, you know, like you're, the, any novelty that there is in the work is kind of the, coming from the technology itself. Whereas, um, you know, I don't know, like I, I personally am much more interested in, how you take plain, ordinary, everyday things, and it takes a little bit more. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't take a little bit more, but it takes some a, maybe a different kind of ingenuity to to be able to make those things that we all think we know a little bit different, make it into something you don't know. You know, make make take something that's familiar and make it a little bit strange or unusual, or you know, that's that's harder, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think the payoff is bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what was one of those first projects where you were able to maybe succeed more with those ideas or, like, get to something, uh, killing the teacher and, like, starting to get to, to that, your own idea of architecture? Um, we did this uh, dorm building down Catamount, which is outside Colorado Springs. Hmm. and. Um, it was in some ways very similar to Greg's work in the sense that it was like variations on a form. Like it's a, it was, it's a combination of self similar forms. So it's like three bars that, that are organized. It's not obvious when you see it, but they're organized in a spiral actually, but they mm -hmm. spiral up on top of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the difference was that instead of it being three blobs, which I think, Sometimes I understand like the Greg's discourse around the blob is super interesting and like why the blob was something to, to take on architecturally. I mean, it was, it was really like compelling is the argument for it. And at the time was, was like totally, uh, you know, like going against the grain. Like it was really like doing something that he knew most people were going to have a problem with and hate, I think maybe even, but that the people who are into it, were going to really, really love, which I appreciate very much. But one of the things that I did was to 
try to maybe say like, okay, well, could we have the, you know, the same intelligence in terms of variation that I learned from him, but could you do it with forms that were a little bit more figural and you know, like something that, would, that you could see more clearly and you could see the differences between them then more clearly. So it was like, could you do the same thing out of Euclidean geometry, you know, just sort of like basic, like, you know, whatever, circles, rectangles, you know, like four or and combinations of those kinds of things. So like in Catamount, there's a lot of curvature, but it's um, much more figural, I would say. And, um, you know, has corners, which Greg's work at the time. Yeah. Did, or at least that, like the, the work that he taught me from was, didn't have mm. a lot of that. And did that, that, that kind of came out of like the, like your cur curve culture book, like, is it the same kind of time, the same that sort was the of same study? Time. Yeah, it's like doing stuff at UIC with students on that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. it's it's interesting where it seems like you, at least from the outside, like gravitate towards these very simple ideas, or and then think about how it multiplies. You know, like like curve culture or framing, or you know, it's like uh, it's like how you make a book on curve right and then it mm -hmm. translates further um do you think i bounce around too much i'm just curious like like because that's like you just mentioned two things that are really not re you know related to each other the curve culture so, and so in that house and framing oh yeah framing. Like, no yeah, yeah. there's a lot of there's like you know did a book on patterns like there's mm -hmm. a lot of topics but it's yeah i mean i'm curious like what's your you can you can tell me honestly, yeah. by the way. No, you, I I'm you know, personally you I get I'm just kind of schizophrenic with architecture and I like to bounce around and sort of have mm -hmm. my just my view on different things, you know, get distracted and go to something else. And, but I think, you know, like you've been you've been working for a while and having these different phases, I guess, in a way. Um, you know, I think so there's there's curves and there's then there's sort of pattern and then then there's sort of like what's your relationship with like sort of postmodernism or like a neo postmodernism or something you know um uh i think you know maybe if it if it appears you bounce around is because you're clear in what you're doing right like a lot of people most architects bounce around a lot but aren't as clear in what they're doing or interested in and you know what do you mean you mean like i mean like i mean like oh bounce i'm gonna around, do a, but it's okay i'm gonna do a concrete building then i'm now i'm interested in wood or whatever you know like every site's different people are different but you have a uh -huh. a more conceptual clarity around what you're doing i think so you think it's okay to bounce around as long as you're thoughtful and clear in any one given moment i think it's yeah it goes back to my idea of architecture of of just like clarity of knowing what you're doing and having a control over yeah the 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 thing you're doing and being able to say it and yeah um, I guess now that you, you know, hearing you put it that way, I may have kind of unintentionally backed into a way of resisting, you know, signature and some of the hmm. crap that we kind of, I think most of us don't like about, you know, I don't know, the architecture of 15 to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So you did, you did that. Um that project then what was kind of the next the, the next project or next phase in that in that journey to where you're at now hmm. what'd you do with pattern was, was pattern after curve no it's a little bit before yeah. that actually and it was um i mean you know this stuff like i don't know i mean you, you know it's some of the things you do like it doesn't even matter what you're trying to do it's just kind of like happens like mm -hmm. you're, you're you have your your own tendencies that show up in every project regardless of whether you consciously you know activate them or not mm -hmm. um bring them in or not so 
patterns still, I mean, still, I think there's a lot of patterns in the work that, that we do, but at the time it was, um, you know, looking at patterns, there, p- pattern itself had a kind of negative connotation among a certain group of architects because it was, because they, they related it to Christopher Alexander mm-hmm. and, you know, pattern language. Mm-hmm. And this idea, I mean, that's like very moralistic work, you know? So, so, I mean, he, he makes the case that there are, you know, certain good, um, you know, I don't know what it, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like good characteristics and diagrams of architecture that have been there since the beginning of time. And you can look and see how, you know, where, how they've always been there. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at a Palladian villa or, a you know, a, a Roman temple or a, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house that it's always like, it, there's certain, certain, um, organizational principles and deep structures to, to architecture that are, that are good. And once you've uncovered those, you know, you like anybody can design hmm. good architecture. Hmm. Um, and understandably a lot of architects for that reason were really, uh, put off by the idea that their work might be patterned, you know, like, because they didn't want to be part of that. Like they, they didn't want to, you know, yeah, they didn't want to be associated with that. And, and he did such a good job of, of, of the kind of like claiming that term hmm. that, um, that word pattern that it would really like became a problem. So like, I don't know, it started working on that a little bit with David Solomon, who was, um, uh, that was when we were both at Cornell and we, so we, you know, researched patterns and kind of like what, you know, what, what is it in different fields? Cause it, you look in, in, you know, crystallography, there's, you know, clear definitions of what patterns are and in, in uh, chemistry and in, um, like behavioral sciences and like, you know, all these other fields, there are, there are different, I, you know, different, like very clear, clearly different, um, ideas of what patterns are. And so we were kind of looking at that and trying to open it up a little bit, actually, and just sort of say like, well, it, you know, it could be lots of things and it could be something that's not fixed and universal and permanent, but something that can, that can adapt or change or, um, uh, uh, you know, be very different from the kind of pattern that Alexander described. And so, um, yeah, but that was also just kind of like one of these projects where like framing or something like that, you know, sort of like trying to, you know, anytime you, find something that people don't seem to be talking about or, or everybody hates, mm-hmm. which is weird to think that people hated the idea of pattern back then. Cause it's pretty like, it's okay now, you know, and lots of people either are into it or just use them or have no problem with them. And so, mm-hmm. um, all because of your, book. by the way, the, the other, the other definition of pattern that was like equally offensive for people is the superficial one that it's just like, mm. like, like, a pattern on your clothes. Yeah. It's just like something like for architecture, it's just like something that goes on a facade and kind of like, you know, gussies it up, but doesn't actually, you know, influence the deep structure of the work. Mm-hmm. So it's, so it's weird because you got these, these two like <laughs> totally, um, like you know, these different definitions that were completely opposite of one another that everybody hated. And so, um, anyway, were, but, were you addressing both of those in the book? Yeah, I mean, and kind of trying to, but then also like try to try to present like all of these other definitions that are you know not those two that that um, present different and very useful ideas of pattern for design, um, you know, that weren't so absolute or um, and that uh, yeah, and to try to try to say like well there might be other definitions or other ways of seeing patterns and using them in design. So did you have a project that came out of that, that sort of research or that way of thinking? Not really. I mean, kind of the, we did this one project for, um, for the young architects program, the PS one, mm-hmm. um, which was, which kind of had bad. I mean, there were other, like there were other, you know, at the time there were all these like kind of, little research projects was just inventing for myself like yeah just try to make a concrete wall or 
you know, and maybe we can use a, like, a, I, yeah, and there was, like, there was some patterning in those and, like, how to, you know, how to use it a little bit differently in that. So, yeah, I guess there were projects. Like, yeah. the project that I think about a lot of yours is the, where you put together the different standard sections of a metal building. And uh, yeah. uh, that's really, like, goes back to Greg, that project. Hmm. Hmm. Of I doing mean, that's it like a real st standardized way. Yeah, it's like a different version of his embryologic houses, except instead of, you know, so it's like, you know, if it for for modern architecture, you know, variation is like, you know, maybe maybe one of the uh, you know, one of the best examples would be a kid of parts modern variation would be the Eames house. So you have a kind of standard steel structure, and then you can put different panels of different materials in. So like, you know, you can put in glass or a blue panel or a door or, you know, but it's, but the form stays the same and the materials can, can be swapped out to customize it. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost the inverse for Greg's project. And then for that project that you're mentioning, which is like um, all the panels are made of the same materials, but they have different forms. And so putting them together in different ways will give you different building hmm. forms. And so you could take the same, you know, like a collection of panels and by kind of like, you know, assembling them into different profiles. And then like that was a build, it's a building system. It's like a really standard off the shelf um, barn or, you know, kind of industrial shed yeah. kind of a building system, which is just these, these, uh, galvanized steel panels that that get screwed together to make an arch the arch can have different forms i mean it can look like a standard arch it can have a kind of rounded house shaped form it can be like a quonset hut um and then but then you those arches are kind of assembled um linearly to make a vault essentially so they're all vaults and um but if you put the panels together in the wrong order you get a different shape vault mm -hmm. and so um I mean, I still love that project, and there's actually a where you it never really like we never like tried like four or five times to try to like get a, like make that yeah. really make it, and kind of never really got to the finish line. But we have a project in the office now that I think I think is gonna do it. <laughs> so, but yeah, nice. I like that one. If I if I may say so. <laughs> It's kind of like saying you like your own work. <laughs> you can like your own work. Yeah, I guess. You should, right? Sometimes. Yeah, but should you say you like your own work? I'm not, I don't know. I mean, you can say, I I did a good job that time, and I did a bad, a worse job. Yeah, we've done a bad job plenty of times. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, was, what was one of those projects? The bad jobs? Um, there was this... Uh, um, kind of a, I don't know what it was, a conference, convention, something like that, that, um, when Hickenlooper was the governor, he, he organized this and it, was, and it was like, kind of like to bring a bunch of, I was an outsider to it for sure, but it was, cause it was mostly people in business, like really big people in business who were, I think it was really the idea was to talk about innovation in Colorado and bring in people who are even thinking of, who are thinking of moving companies here or something like that. I don't know. And, and but the, they asked if I would be interested in designing some kind of like furniture for it. And we made these blocks that were kind of, um, like house shaped, like pentagonal hmm. blocks. They were just, you know, laminate. There was wood covered in laminate and you could assemble them in different ways to make different things. You can make them. And then there were padded seats that could go on them. So, you can make it high enough to put a drink on it or low enough to sit on it or like all these things. But it really just looked like shit. And kind of like, to be honest, I mean, it was, they were okay, but it was like, you know, not, we didn't take the site into account when we did it. It was like in the DCPA, which is, which I like a lot, by the way, that could be another, hmm. could be in a top 10, maybe that would make the list to be honest. But, um, uh, yeah, it just was, it just wasn't great. It just didn't, it didn't turn out well. Hmm. Yeah. I don't think. When did you move back to Colorado? 
2000, kind of 2008, but I was still teaching like back east then. So I, was, I really was here full time starting in 2009. And was that just how a lot of us got here, moving closer to family? And yeah, or what was, yeah, that yeah, was the, just going back home. Yeah. For me. Yeah. And my wife, friends from here too. Mm. Yeah. And, and so then when did the teaching in Chicago happen? And this sort that was of... a couple of years later. So I took a few years off from teaching to start the office here and then eventually went back to teaching, but in Chicago. What was that like having your own office full time? I mean, you had been teaching that whole time, right? And yeah, probably doing projects on the side, but mm-hmm. what was the experience of being a full time architect? Um, I mean, I loved it. It was great. It is great. I, I, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's all, you know, it's at first it was a little scary. Yeah. You know, kind of go out on your own and not like, I don't know if I can do this scary more like how the hell am I going to, you know, pay for things mm-hmm. scary. Um, you know, like not having a steady income and knowing that you can't just kind of like not, be in that situation for too long yeah you know like like that that was yeah i guess that was a little nerve-wracking but um but also just kind of like so great to you know hang hang your own shingle out and say hey you know like i'm gonna give it a shot and see see what this is like and yeah I mean, what, what were some of the first yeah, projects awesome. that came in i guess well first i i asked that just because i think i've bounced around a lot and i have like a lot of insecurities about like oh i don't know actually how to be a professional architect because i've because i never have enough patience to stay at a firm or something and so thinking about you who it seems like hadn't really worked at a firm and starting a starting a firm i had oh you had that's yeah where were you working? I mean, so there, when I graduated, so before I even graduated from grad school, like I had worked at some offices in LA. And then when I graduated, it was actually, it was 2001 and it was a really shitty time to graduate. It was like a, the dot com bubble just burst. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, I think in LA, for example, Frank Geary's had laid off like some huge number of people on his staff, like, you know, that spring or early in the summer of that year of 2001. So it wasn't a good time, but what was good was that there were offices that would hire you to help out for like a little while on mm-hmm. something. So you could go, you know, like I worked in at George Hughes office. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was, he taught at um, SciArc and, you know, was a really talented, really interesting architect um, who, you know, sadly is not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, I worked in his office for a few weeks on this competition for a building for Sony that he was trying to get. And um, I worked at Johnston Mark Lee for a while on a Mm -hmm. competition for a bridge in St. Louis. And I um, worked at Morphosis for a couple of weeks, just like, you know, like on a form Z model, I think, (laughs) or something like, like, like something that you would only be working on from 1998 to 2002. Um, and, uh, um, I worked at, uh, Richard Meyer's office. I mean, it sounds like I'm name dropping, but that was just like kind of who was around in LA, you know, it was, yeah. it was just, uh, I wasn't, you know, it's just like some of those people were people who I had, had had as teachers and the others were people who they had kind of like said, you know, kind of recommended me to or whatever. What was great about that was I got to bounce around and see a bunch of different offices. Yeah. And, and I had worked for a year at the office in Breckenridge. And then, you know, so I, I and I worked for a contractor, this guy, John Cordick, hmm. who's like a really, really good contractor in LA. Um, to, you know, like even now he's doing like really, really nice projects. Um, I don't know why I say even now. It's not like he's old or something. <laughs> he's totally, you know, I'm sure he'll be doing great projects for a long time. But he's a really good contractor, like really good. And, and, I learned a ton from him. Um, so I actually did have a fair bit of experience, even though it wasn't, you know, like five years in this office or something like that. It was, it was short, generally short, you know, kind of stints in different places, but it was great. Yeah. It was a good way to learn a lot. 
And so then, so when you you started your own firm, what projects were coming along? I don't remember, to be honest. Eventually, you got some projects and made some money, and or or not as much, and then then went no, back to I, teaching. No, we, we didn't make money for ten years. <laughs> we didn't it, like like you know literally by tax. You know, look because you do your taxes every year, or whatever you see what your expenses are and what your revenues. And I'm not like this wasn't like like a something I managed for tax purposes. I mean, this is like really true. Like we didn't actually have a profit in a year for ten years. Mm. Um, so, and, you know, like I mentioned, I'm the son of school teachers, so it's not like I have a trust fund or something like that. So I have like an incredibly patient wife huh. who is like, it's cool. Like we can make this work. And, and I taught and I could make a little bit of money teaching enough to, and that was, you know, reliable income. So, yeah. um, Nice. I, I think we could have made money earlier, but not doing the kind of work that. Right. So you were saying no a lot to a lot of projects? Not to a lot, but to a few. And, um, and, uh, but also, um, seeking out and saying yes to a lot of projects that are of a type that don't really make you a ton of money. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. That's how it, how it went. So then how'd you, how'd you end up in Chicago teaching and continue um, to, I think it's a pretty unique situation. So a, um, like an old friend, Sean Lally, who, um, graduated from UCLA the year after me, um, was teaching there and he, there was an ACSA conference and he invited me to, you know, present a paper to like propose a paper, which then was accepted. And so I went there for the conference and then the next year they had a search, but I, you know, it was, it was great to be there for the conference. And I met some people who were there. And so then when the search came around, they asked if I was interested. And so, so I applied and, uh, um, yeah, that was a 10 year track search. Um, but instead of taking tenure track, I took a part time, you know, negotiated a, part-time position with a three-year, I don't know, do you care about this? Like the, yeah, I think so. The specificity of my I mean, teaching contract? Maybe not. It seems like we've gotten like way off. We, into, we can take, I guess, I guess what I'm interested in is this sort <laughs> of like, the weeds now. <laughs> is this sort of like your, your by city existence? Yeah. You know, are, are you a, are you a Chicago architect? Are you a, Colorado no, architect, Denver. or you, you yes, uh, Colorado, yeah, for sure, but yeah, it, but it seems like you're much more integrated into the Chicago kind of architectural scene than maybe Denver, or what's your maybe? I, you know, I don't know that I'm integrated well into either one, to mm. be honest, and that's not by by choice or intention. It's 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 more just me being antisocial. I think, to be honest, like I mean, to be told, like I'm being like you know, really brutally honest here. Mm -hmm. Nobody can see this on the screen, but I'm actually blushing right now because, you know, it's a podcast. It's matching but, um, your pledge here, yeah. Yeah, I I do honestly, um, did you just screenshot that? No, I didn't. I had like an alert that popped up. I saw up. you reach down. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I do have video of this whole thing if we want to release it, but yeah, it's up to you. No, it's okay. You can not release it. It would be great. Um, yeah, I'm not as... Um, I'm more, I, I'm, I, I guess I feel very comfortable taking risks in the work and doing things that may seem brash or may seem controversial or something like that. I may put people off or, or, or something like that, or maybe, but I also hope that maybe some of that stuff like people love too. I, I'm much more shy socially. Like I, I'm not very, um, very outgoing. And so I, I, you know, when I'm in Denver, I am in the office a lot and, or I'm home with, you know, my wife and my kids who are weird and funny and really great to hang out with. Um, and, um, and when I'm in Chicago, um, you know, at the school with students or most of the time in my hotel or something like that, you know, so I'm not, 
super connected in either place, to mm. be honest. Um, and I, I think yeah, I've, you know, I I've read somewhere you said something like, uh, you know, it's easier to take chances architecturally in Denver or something, uh, you know, because it's less visible yeah. than, than Chicago. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. And it, I mean, it just seems to or, me, you know, the, I mean, it's a little less in Chicago, but definitely a lot less than New York or LA mm -hmm. or yeah. Boston. There's also a lot less pressure. Uh, you know, people who, you know, if you, if you live in those cities, first of all, it's, it's expensive, you know, so you gotta, you have to try to afford to live there, which is hard. You know, you have to make a lot more money to live in those places. And that, that I think ties your hands a bit. And then, um, but also I, I would, I would probably go nuts in those cities because there's so much going on and it, uh, it's like, you know, constantly like, you know, who's in this show or who got invited to mm. write for this thing or whatever. I, and, and I would be, take all of that very personally, to be totally honest. And mm -hmm. I think I would like have a, I would be, I would be, I would feel left out of a lot of things or. I don't know. I just, it, that, that pressure and that intensity, it would, would be difficult for me. Um, I feel more free here to just kind of do fun, uh, stuff and, um, yeah, just to see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I envy you in a lot of ways of, of being able to ha be based here and then be able to kind of engage in a different, uh, scene in chicago and you know and kind of come back and forth where you're not like you're saying you're not sort of like if you don't get invited to those chicago shows you're like hey i'm not a chicago architect and it it's better it'd be better for my ego and i guess i don't know yeah i mean it's yeah i guess it's a coping mechanism or something hmm. right like but um I, you know, I know it seems, it might seem cliche or I'm just like talking shit or something, but I actually really do love the work. Like, I, I, I mean, for me, it's like, I, I really, like, I like the, the work, the design work and the, you know, being in the office or like just, you know, or wherever I am, just like working on the stuff. And I'm okay doing that, you know, kind of off the radar, wherever. Um, I mean, you can't be totally off the radar if you have any ambition to contribute to discourse. And also if you want to do work that, you know, you don't work by yourself, no architect does. So you, you still obviously have to have some connections and, you know, I like try to try to be out in the world a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's, um, I guess what I'm saying is it's not, it's not even so much like I'm trying to escape, you know, the pain of not being included in things in other cities as much as it just seems quiet here and um, in a way that suits me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. I mean, but then like um, your mother house, you know, that was pretty visible here, uh, you know, at least in publication. It got published a lot. And then I think it, it created a lot of discourse and different places you know like uh it, it was like the cover image of of denver fugly for a while and, and i had to sort of stop stop following them stop reading those comments on on that um but it like it was really a, a provocative great, by the way i'm well, totally happy for that see, I, I was wondering how you feel but you know like it was a very provocative project and uh you know i love it uh because of the the sort of rigor that went into it, what? Be clear, I don't want I don't want people to hate the work, but I think it's I would rather there be some people who really like it and some people who hate it than have it be kind of like just a nothing, know, yeah, yeah, neutral for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Um, not just for me, like just for, like for architecture in general. Like I, I would you know much prefer to see things that I hate than things that I have no opinion on. Mm -hmm. how, how did that house, how did that project end up for you in your mind? Did it, did it check all the boxes? I mean, I know you, you developed it and, and, and built it yourself. Right. And, um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very heady project, that one. Mm -hmm. I think um, the one I mentioned before, Catamount, for Mm -hmm. me, has a more, has a stronger, um, like this more visceral presence when you go there. So uh, in a way, I'm partial to that one. Mm I mean, not like those are the only two projects, but but but, but as a counterpoint to mm-hmm. to the to the one in Sunnyside, I, I like the project in Sunnyside a lot, and I I'm proud of it, and I think that there are some really interesting things going on in it. Um, but I think it's most interesting intellectually, and <laughs> is not bad um, aesthetically. Whereas I think the building we get down and you know, down at Catamount in Woodland Park is much stronger, has a much stronger presence. Hmm. Okay. In a way, I would prefer to do more of that, but we'll see. That's interesting, that idea of sort of like good conceptually versus good uh, experientially, maybe, in a way. You know, and I yeah, use that I mean, word good again. Yeah, like the best is when you have both, but yeah. I mean, how many, ma- you know, that's like what, that's, that's what I would strive for, for sure. I mean, to me, that's like, I don't know, the Salk Institute. Like, so that's mm-hmm. like, you know, they're masterpieces. That, who knows? If you're lucky, maybe you stumble into one or two your whole your whole life, unless you're just like a genius. Yeah. Which I'm not. Which, yeah. But, um, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think about that that project a lot, and you know, I've I've had students like study it and things, but but mostly because I I live in Sunnyside as well, and I think about uh-huh. this typology a lot, and I think about what yeah. you can do with it, and um, and the way you sort of broke it apart and kind of flipped the program around inside, and um, so did that did that get you thinking about that project? Did that get you into thinking about framing in general? Yeah, but kind of a. Indirectly, um, Paul Preisner, mm-hmm. my friend and colleague at UIC, um, he and I have done um, a number of things together. Um, at that point, mostly for the Biennial of the Americas here or the Chicago Architecture Biennial. But mm-hmm. we, it was like looking back, it's kind of funny because we had done several biennials. Like none of this was planned at all. But we, you know, we we were. Like fortunate to be able to do a couple of things here. One was just these two steel barns, which is that system we were talking about earlier that were in, in Civic, Center, um, Civic Center Park for this like uh, music for animals, like temporary art <laughs> festival that uh, that Adam Lerner and Chris Kalmeyer put on, and um, and then we did these we uh, an installation of these big foam styrofoam blocks in a building you know, down off 16th street for another pioneer of the Americas. And then we did two, two other installations. One was like steel vault in, um, in Chicago, like right near the bean in millennium park. And another one with these, um, glazed blocks, like walls that were in the Chicago cultural center. All of those projects were full scale projects, um, for biennial exhibitions. And, um, but then also at some point, you know, with the mother house you were, that you were just talking about, I was looking at it and I had this photo of it when it was just framed and, you know, covered in the OSB. So it was just like an all wood version of, the, of it. And I sent that to Paul and he was working on a house around the same time and had a similar photo from it. And we were talking about how it's like, like, wouldn't it be great to somehow just like to have it like that, to mm-hmm. just have a wood, just this like wood OSB building, but it's impossible to do, you know, well, I mean, you could do it, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't work out very well. Um, but, and then we just started talking about framing. And at some point, you know, we realized that framing was, uh, we learned that framing is a very American thing. Um, you know, that it's like, uh, only in the U S do we build in wood framing, um, in Canada but nobody else in the world uses it. So it's like literally very American, but it's also like conceptually very American for a number of reasons. And so we thought like maybe it'd be a good thing to propose for Venice since that's an international exhibition and we could do something at the U.S. Pavilion to show like this 
construction type. And, and at the same time, we also understood that it was not something people in architecture are talking about as a sort of like there and taken for granted as a, as a, as a way of building in the U S and maybe has been, um, kind of codified and, you know, is, is only done in a particular way now, but could be opened up again. Like, you know, like actually it was in its the very early days uh, of its history when some, some, some pretty odd things were built in wood framing hmm. um, because people were just experimenting with how to do it, whatever. So, um, so yeah, so then we proposed it for Venice and luckily we got it. And we did that exhibition. What was, what was that experience like? I mean, a just like back back from I mean, being a student, kind of full circle, and then yeah. and doing the whole yeah. American pavilion. And funny enough, I did like Paul and I. Paul was in, so I was in Greg's studio for that 2001, and Paul was in Hani Rashid's. We <laughs> both had worked there, and also funny, neither one of us went to Venice for that. <laughs> so we never met each other, and we didn't. And then later, we became friends. I had no idea that you know we both had work in the U.S. Pavilion <laughs> as students. We realized that like after we had already like the first time we went to Venice after we'd been awarded the project, we were walking around. I was like, "Hey, you know, in 2000, actually, I worked here." And he was like, "Really? Like, yeah, me too. I was in Hobby Studio at Columbia." And so, huh. yeah, it was a kind of a funny thing. But it also like I think that it hit us right then also that like that was a big deal for us to be able to do something as a student, you know, with that, you know, in that kind of a place with that kind of an, you know like attention to it. And so we did the same, you know, we, we tried to, well, we didn't try, we did like help our students, you know, at UIC do a bunch of work for the, for the show that we did so that they could see that their work also, you know, could be out there and could be important or whatever. So, so yeah, it was definitely very much like a, like a related and kind of like full circle experience. Yeah. Hmm. Well, hey, man, you know, I, like I said, I, I reached out to you the first, first person to, to come here and always enjoyed your work and um, always want to talk to you more. And uh, you always pick up the phone nicely and um, encouraged by your work and your thought, uh, thoughtfulness with projects. And thanks for, thanks for coming on and talking with me. It's my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that like I'm, I'm a bit, I am a bit shy, you know, when it comes to like some kinds of things. And, and um, I feel very comfortable talking about the work, um, you know, whether it's mine or somebody else's. Um, but I, uh, you know, this, even though it's just you and me right now, this makes me feel a little bit more part of like the, you know, the, the, the city. And, um, and I'm very grateful for that. So thanks. nice. Oh, yeah. Thanks thank you for listening to this week's show you can visit architecting.com that's architect-ing.com to see images from this week's guest and please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts have a great week and keep connecting By the way, it's way too long. Nobody's gonna listen to all this. This is um, this is this is good. I'm really enjoying this, but it's one of the windier ones that I've had. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. See, this is why I said I had to prepare to be better. Uh, I had to to practice with you. How do you know though? Like when you hear a good podcast, don't you? At this point, don't you just assume that it? it, it I mean, maybe they're all windy too. They're just edited. Wow. Mm -hmm. well. I used to be pretty scared of like the the silence you know and, and and like and then it would just freak me out and i would i'd be sitting here while the guest was talking and i would be trying to come up with the next question you know and then i'm like oh shit what what did they even say you know <laughs> yeah. um it's a, yeah so it takes a lot to be like oh, okay it's, it's okay if i don't know what to ask next or yeah. whatever um, yeah but <laughs> yeah it just makes it edit more <laughs> yeah i think i'd have that problem too by the way what else so what what would you say? I guess we hit on this a little bit, but what is what is community to you? What is what is your community uh, architecturally? What or who? I guess. Yeah, I guess there are a few. Like, there's the 
you know, the, the group of, and it's a big group of people who I really respect in the field, who, who I really love talking to and, and, you know, hearing what they're up to, talking about projects that are out there, like what you think of them, you know, like that, like that kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, I think like that gossip is huge mm -hmm. and really matters and, and it matters to me. Um, and so I, uh, you know, they, they are, that's one. I guess there's also like, I don't know. I don't really think a lot of us have a community that's like with other people who may or may not still be alive who are hmm. kind of like hmm. who you think of as either the people who you're working with or against historically. Interesting. Yeah. Um, because I think it's like, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of, other architects in other eras and try to understand like what what were they trying to do and how did they do it and 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 it's, it's amazing sometimes like some, and sometimes really intimidating yeah to, to just see how clearly they worked and and you know how, how just how like brilliant they were about understanding what they could do and how to do it and you know i don't know like that that's a community too i think in a way yeah. you know that where, where you're Right. And and um and then I think, you know, kind of what I was talking about earlier on about the community of people you work with, whether that's your clients or or engineers or you know the people who are going to be in and around the projects that you design. You know, which is a little bit more traditional definition, but one that really matters. You know, I think that's yeah, I mean that's that, that that's an important one too. So I don't know. Like for me, there's there are there are all those. Yeah, all those people for sure. I like that. I like. I, I've never heard it put that way of the sort of community of of past architects, right, or past people, and because mm -hmm. I think about that a lot of sort of, and maybe it comes with your history uh, degree. I, I I like history a lot and kind of dissecting people's career and, and lives and thinking about how my own's fitting into it and mostly just mm -hmm. depressing me that I haven't done enough by this age or whatever, but, uh, yeah. Why is that? Why are you worried about that? Be because man, what am I doing? I'm slack slacking off. I need, need to do more. I need to, how old are you? need to keep up. Old? I'm, I'm so, old. I'm, I'm an old, I'm an old 30, 30, uh, seven. Nah, you're fine. You know, there's a story about uh, uh, Tom Maine that he was working and kind of struggling and doing all these, you know, like he did some houses and stuff, like the Blades residence, and like all these, you know, all these like the 2468, you know, project and like doing all these, his own house, like all this stuff, and then maybe making some furniture and some drawings to help him pay the bills. And, and he, he he was talking to Frank Gehry one time. He was saying, like, hey, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't think I'm going to make it. Like, I'm <laughs> just, you know, I just don't think I'm going to ever make the leap. And it's just, I'm just going to be, like, this kind of, like, okay architect who does a few things here and there. <laughs> Frank Gehry was like, well, how, you know, how old are you? He was, he was 48. And he said, like, well, don't worry. Like, just wait until you're 50, 51, 52. Because when you hit 50, for some reason, it all takes off. And you get big public projects and that's that's the way it happens for like before then especially when you're doing weird stuff nobody trusts you enough you know you need some gray hair you need some you, know, you need to have been around for a while and people need to see that you've been around for a while and then sure enough like you know he's got the the uh what was it like that uh, caltrans building mm. and the courthouse you know up in northern california and like you know you got to start getting all these all these um projects like right after you turn 50 so yeah yeah but he also started an architecture school like in his 30s so i mean yeah yeah but, yeah but it was a different time for yeah. sure um yeah so to answer your question yes i'm drinking a pre-mixed cocktail Ooh. it's what? the first time i've had this but you, one of your questions said, like, what story would you tell ah. after you've had a few cocktails? And I didn't know, so I got a few of these. Oh, there you go. So now what's the story? 
I don't know. I thought the the Tom Main one was pretty good. Yeah, but it's kind of like you know, hey Tom Main. <laughs> yeah, but you like. You... I love Tom Main, by the way. I have a huge soft spot for him. Hmm. I mean, that guy is like, I, he truly loves architecture. Like, it's not. It, he is not in it for any reason other than his own, just like love of, you know the field and being part of it and seeing what other people are doing and, and and getting involved in the project. I mean, he's really like, he's a true architect. Yeah. Like really. I mean, just, the, just the stories amazing. I've heard of like, you know, him sleeping, so in his, sleeping in his car, uh, when getting the firm going and then starting Sci yeah. Arc and like wanting to start a grad school. So we had to go to, gsd to get a grad degree before you could start a grad school <laughs> like it's right. just just craziness of thinking thinking about that uh i mean he's like got a little bit of a hippie in him, mm-hmm. you know in the best way like he really is optimistic and believes like you know like you can you can do you know you can change the world you can do amazing things like you know that, that people can get along like all of it you know he's really i mean he's a special person for sure but, I've, uh, I've only seen him one time and he was doing reviews at Yale and uh, yeah. it was, I forgot who, who, who he was reviewing, but he was reviewing the work and then uh, Peter Eisman was on the other side and he, they were just like talking shit to each other over, mm-hmm. over the wall, uh, mm-hmm. just, just indirectly and passively, but very yeah. strongly. That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, All right. There's a good one. Like what, uh, what's the funniest thing you've ever heard in a review? It might have might have been it might have been his. He was just he was just like, um, you know, Tom was like these these projects are all horrible, uh, <laughs> but it's not your fault. It's because you're at Yale and and you don't know how to design this way. And he's like, you, <laughs> it, these are bad, but it's not your fault. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You you guys don't know how to think think this way that uh, they're doing. Uh, it was yeah. it was uh, for That's Spina, good. yeah, Spina Studio. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that was pretty. Good. And then I think he's that's great. what he was saying. Marcelo's like, like, great, by the way, right? Do you like Marcelo? I love Marcelo. I think he's really great. You know, I I I, I didn't quite get it. I, I didn't. Maybe it's because I'm from Yale and I don't know how to how to think that way. But. I don't know him from that perspective. Like, be, you know, like, but. As a like a oh, as a person, as a colleague oh, or yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, like like he, I mean, he's like a really. I think he also is like actually really loves architecture. Yeah, and is, is genuinely interested. Yeah, he seemed he seemed seemed fun, and, and the students definitely were very very devoted to him. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your best? I've got two. I've got two. Yeah, one is um, Peter Cook was on a review mm-hmm. one time, and he said. You know, he's like very British. And he said, uh, you know, this project, I hate it so much. I'm beginning to like it. And I thought that was great. That made me laugh. You're like, where do I take that? Where do I take that? Yeah. Comment? It wasn't to me. It was to somebody right, else. But, but I, I would have loved if it was to me. It would be an even better story. But um, it was to someone else. But, but, uh, at the time, I just thought it was hilarious, and then like later, I thought about it. I was like, no, I actually kind of get that. Like, mm. you get to a point, don't you think? Like, mm. you get to a point where you're like, you know, this is so awful. Mm-hmm. Like, this is so bad that it's actually getting to a point where you think, like, you know what? I need to actually change my view of what's beautiful mm. or what's, uh, you know, what I like because this is like way off in another direction. It's starting to be interesting because it's, it's like, you know, so much like what i don't like that i you know maybe i need to visit my own and it yeah situation. and it's sort of yeah. back to your idea yeah. of like surprise right of yeah uh, yeah as exactly. an instructor right like the, the, yeah yeah you have to see you yeah. see so much and then to be actually be surprised by something uh yeah is nice yeah it's great it's the best what was the second one uh so i was at um at a review for um a friend of mine this guy Ciro Nakle, who, who um ran a studio where uh, the, the, the students were designing, like what one of the projects that in the studio was, was a mountain. Um, but it was an, a, it was an apartment building that basically was like 
as big as and in the shape of a mountain. It's called the Generic Sublime, was the name of the hmm. studio. It's a great studio. But this apartment building was massive. Like it was just like an enormous apartment building. And Sanford Quinter was on hmm. the review. And somebody said something or other, like, or a comment or two. And then all of a sudden, Sanford was like, like, hang on a second. And, and oh, and the project was in Lebanon. And he, and he was like, wait a second. So this is this giant building in Lebanon. He's like, what is going on in this building? There are like wars. They're going to break out in the <laughs> building. There are going to be factions on this floor, like fighting with ones on that. And he like invented this whole, like kind of like, like I don't know. It was like it was like a he imagined an entire world inside the project that was completely consistent with the way that the project was presented, but not what any of us had pictured at all. And it was like, and he went on this thing where he was like, you know, about wars breaking out between floors on the building or whatever. It was, it was amazing. So good. That guy seems extremely sharp. Just, he is just the best. unexpected. Yeah. Uh, I've never met him, but just videos and things. And, and oh God. And, he's the, he's, uh, he is, he's funny. He's smart. He's like so open-minded and, and, you know, game for, you know, going like a lot of different directions as long, but, but he's also incredibly quick to sniff out something that's inauthentic or, you know, like inconsistent or something like, you know, he, like he, he will call people out. And when he does, it's, it's a little bit jarring mm. because he is so, kind of like positive and funny and fun and, and, and smart. But um yeah, I mean he's really he's really great. The last last time I talked to him he was gonna work on a a project called the Origin of Form. Hmm. <laughs> just, just a small project. It's yeah. great. Yeah. He was gonna go to Africa huh. to find like the origin of form. Huh. Seems perfect. Huh. Right? Like it's just like a it's like before primitive hut or something or they're just yeah so the, i mean but if you're gonna if you're gonna have like your kind of like you know signature like you know the project of your career it should be on something as big as form and you should be like go to africa to find it you know it's like it seems like that like, like he had a like a perfect idea of what makes this project important and grand you know like it was so good he told me Oh, here's a good thing. Like, if you want, like, just something like that you can kind of like latch onto, that's a good, like, yeah, I got one thing out of a podcast kind of a thing. He told me something once that's probably like the most influential thing anybody ever told me, which was, uh, you know, I talked to him and I was like, hey, you know, ask him for some advice. I said, like, hey, you know, should I be, should I be applying for more awards or trying to kind of like, like, what should I be doing to try to get my work out there to be part of, you know, part of the discourse or whatever? I was young and, and this was when I was, you know, just had started teaching and we happened to be in the same place. And I kind of I asked him this and he said something to me. He said, uh, um, you know, don't worry about it. Just do good work. Hmm. And if you do enough good work, people can't ignore it. Hmm. And that probably like if i had to say like the one thing that anybody ever told me that like really was like a kind of like guiding principle that that's it hmm. for sure but also so liberating right that, like you don't have to worry about like making sure people see this or read that or whatever in order for it to be part of our you know the 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 world of architecture or the community that you're working in like just do good work and eventually if you do enough good work people will you know people will notice and it'll it'll you know like it, it'll it'll have a positive effect on the world yeah I, but i think that's so, so funny and it's such a good bookend because we're back to that word that we started with of good of good and, yeah. and it goes back again to and that yeah, like almost totally. stresses me out more than anything of doing good work because then i'm like oh shit well what what is good what is but, yeah but it, but it's but his his definition of good was also not a moralistic for mm -hmm. definition you know to, uh, you know just to go back to it, it's just like you know if you, if you do things that are provocative and that are um you know that that or that do take a position on something that you care about, like, 
for me, maybe it's like doing some work that is that is kind of anti-elitist, not kind of, it is anti-elitist or that is trying to make a case for architecture that's, you know, that that's like for everybody and and um, maybe more engaged. And, you know, it's, it's less like a, like a signature of myself or, you know, or something like that, but more something that other people can kind of like recognize and appreciate, you know, in relation to the world that they know. Uh, like that's like you just if you think that's good like you know i I think he i guess what i'm saying is like he had a very flexible and um or has a very flexible and fluid understanding of what's good it's not like you do good work like you know you do work that makes humanity better or something like that no and i guess I, i don't mean it from like a moralistic sense either but of just um you know, I just always think of, uh, I, I freak myself out a little bit. Maybe that's maybe freak myself out, but of just everything I'm doing is like, Oh, is this, is this any good? Is this any good? You know? And, uh, what, why, why am I going, why am I doing this type of work? What am I doing? Uh, yeah, I do that too. Yeah. But yeah. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Cool. You never know. Cool, man. Um, all right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again for this. It's, it's really, I mean, it's really like means a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, definitely. I mean, and like flattered. I said, I, you were one of the first ones I wanted on. And I think, you know, the goal with this is to sort of like create more of a community here in Colorado. And yeah. I'm always sort of surprised when, when some people don't know who you are. Uh, and so my goal is to thank you introduce I mean, you to more people. I, I mean, appreciate that and 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 i mean yeah i mean i think it's i think it's like what you're doing i think it's very important Hmm. um i mean i do think that um you know to to, like what you do with this is like i try to do similar things but in other ways Hmm. actually just just so you know i mean like i think it's really important to build up the culture of architecture in denver so for me that's there are a lot of ways to do that but one of the ways that i find that i I think I sometimes have the, the opportunity to do it is by being an ambassador mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for Denver. So like, I mean, I like this is kind of, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, I, I'm not trying to like take credit for this or like blow my own, toot my own horn or something like that. But like, you know, we did this project with housing. We had Productora come to do it. So like kind of like inviting them to be here to like, you know, and they have a very like strong sentimental connection to Denver now. Plus they did this really nice project here. And that project, other people in other places see and they're like, oh, shit's going yeah. on in Denver, you know? So, like, I don't know. Like, for me, that's that's one way that I can do it. Or I actually I invited Mark Lee and Michael Webb, actually, to, like, come speak here once. Hmm. And it was amazing. Like, I, I, I mean, for me, it was, like, it was such an odd couple, like, the two of them, but in the best way. Yeah. You know, they were very different, but played off of each other perfectly. Like, you know, it was really, that was really good. So. Well, um, just just to have you do the biennial and have have it say Denver underneath it, I think is you know is a big deal for me and f- for being here and like yeah the way like you and Kevin get Denver out on the map a little bit, you know, is always nice. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I really, but I think we all have to kind of mm-hmm. uh, you know do things, and so and and you know this podcast is very it's a very selfless and generous thing that you're doing. And so I, I, I mean, I really, honestly, I, I appreciate it very much, like not just being included, but also you doing it, you know, with every, you know, for everybody and you know, just listening and participate, you know, and speaking on it. Yeah. So, well, thanks. It's, it's mostly self, I mean, it's selfish, but it's, it's mostly just that now I'm known okay. by a, even, a lot of architects and I get to gleam information from everybody and sure but i mean no, of that's course. a joke but yeah yeah but i mean no but i mean it's like it can be selfish and also be great for everybody else too mm-hmm. and it is yeah no i mean really honestly man, i'm like i'm not only flattered to be honest but i'm also like really like so happy that there are people here who are doing like you with this kevin with the lectures at, at ucd you know it's just like it's so good to have like like activity of, of like this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like to, to, and to to like try to build up a community from 
locally, try to like bring other people in, you know, like all of that is, is important. Like you, you can't just have one thing, you know, we can't just have like a few people come to a few projects here mm-hmm. or a few people come lecture or a few people on a podcast. Like we need to have all of this going. And so I, I think it's huge. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, yeah. now we just need to get you to come teach a little bit here. I'll do that. Yeah. Have you met, have you met Mark Swackhammer? Do you know I him? have. Yeah. 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 And he, uh, he, um, like I, he asked me to teach, but it was like, it was, I mean, you know how everything is like in the last year or two, mm-hmm. like it was, it was right before it was like right when we got Venice. And so I was like, shit, I got to teach already this semester, like a double course. And then in the spring, I'm going to be working on Venice. But then all of that, then that was before COVID hit. Now it's like, but now it's kind of like back to the point where maybe I, you know, we should go, we should talk. Again. Nice. That'd be good. I like Mark. How's it working with him? Yeah, it's, he's awesome. I mean, just yeah. uh, very, just a very uh, sharp guy, but very compassionate and very equitable. You know, he's really thinking about equity a lot in the school and, that's good. Um, but then also holding to high standards. Um, but hey, my computer is about to die if if I get cut off. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, little logistics. So uh, once we get off here, we should just keep going until it dies. Like, yeah. Well, we uh, could. The, we could. But the, uh, that seems like an appropriate end. Yeah. Just, just, just keep going. Until yeah. Can. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes here's another. Here, this is a funny story, but it's like. And Kevin can back me up on this. So one time, so he worked in my office for a couple of years. Yeah. And one time, and it was, it was three of us. It was, it, well, I mean, there were more people, but basically there were three of us like full time. It was like him and me and this, and, and this other guy, Jason King. And we won an AIA award. We went up to the AIA conference in Keystone mm. and it was, it was the only time I've gone up to that conference <laughs> and it was so awesome. Jason got shit faced <laughs> and was like, you know, we won an award, and, and but he was, but also Michelle Roykin won like a bunch of awards. Oh, yeah. I think because he had done work with uh, Chris O'Hara, oh yeah, and Julian Bynum, you know, who I know you had on uh-huh. before, yeah. So because they're based in Colorado, the, the well, and his partner was, was like based here, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So and 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 Jason got like they just hammered and was like. <laughs> You know, there was the official ceremony and then we went back to the hotel. And I guess this is like Chris's thing as he brings like a couple bottles of tequila yeah. or something, you know, and then tries to have like a social, you know, yeah. kind of thing. You know? So he did that. I have photos of this. They're great. <laughs> and it's just like Jason drunk. And he's like yelling like, like, I want a Roykins. Like he's just like, I want a Roykins. And you know, it's like super like, you know, <laughs> drunk and happy and just making a massive scene. And everybody there is just kind of like, what is with these like drunk guys? Because I was pretty drunk too. And so, so was Kevin. Like all of us were just like hammered and just like laughing, rolling around the whole thing, just laughing hysterically. It's the only time we were there. I don't even know if I ever, oh, maybe I like applied for one more award like after that or something like that. But it was, it was, that was a really, really good time. And that was a totally Colorado experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, those are fun. Chris I, would probably remember that. My 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 story like that was when I went to the Chicago Biennial and and just yeah. had the same like awesome time. And there's just all these friends from all over and and you were there and I yeah. like talked to you a little bit and then we just drank a lot. And then I came down and you were you were talking with Sam Jacobs and and I just like rumbled in like a gorilla or something and then started talking to Sam about how he reviewed me in grad school and and I remember and I was just so happy and just like yeah. so nicely buzzed and then you looked at me and you're like oh you've been drinking a little bit or something like that and I was like ah oh, I don't shit. remember it was kind of like drunk too okay well you were, not, you, were, you were kind of like dude come on give me some space here but uh, i think i remember that biennial i think uh that year uh sam and a few other people made a presentation at the gram somewhere near the beginning of that hmm. um and um it was packed because it was like the biennial opening weekend or yeah. whatever and we walked in and we we're like oh shit there's no seats and like somebody works for the gram was like no no we can get you a seat like look like you want to sit like up here or whatever hmm. they put us in chairs on the side of the stage <laughs> so 
all of the participants were sitting in front of the stage and like projecting their images up, right? And so anybody who was watching saw the slideshow, but then just to the right was me and like two other people <laughs> just kind of sitting there, right? And Mark Linder, you know him? I know the From name. Syrac- I don't know. He teaches at Syracuse. Hmm. And he started presenting, and I just fell asleep. Like just sacked out. Like, like so, he, Mark Linder slides up there, and I'm just like, you know, just like fully asleep. And you know, eventually I wake up, or whatever, everything goes on. And later that night, um, Sam is like, "Hey, so," because uh, Sam was one of the other presenters. Mm-hmm. Sam was like, "So you really fell asleep in the middle of that, huh?" And I was like, "Oh shit, did you see me?" He's like, "Yeah, everybody saw you. You were just like right on the side, like just, like snoozing." <laughs> And I was like, listen, okay, first of all, my understanding was that the presenters had 10 minutes apiece to present their stuff. I fell asleep. And when I woke up, Mark Linder had been talking for 25 minutes. And he was on the same slide he was on when I fell asleep. So I like, like I have no responsibility. Like you, can, you should blame Mark Linder for that because if he wasn't so boring, I probably would have stayed away. Get those and, slides going. Yeah. 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 But Sam gave me like a ton of shit. It was that was pretty funny. That's funny. And I think that was that weekend. We we had our we had our six month old son there with us. Not not that night, but he was there at the conference with us, walking around and. Uh, That's great. Yeah, uh, we had we another the other night yeah. when we went, when we went out, we brought him into the bar, and he we he was just in the carrier, and we just stuck him underneath the bar table, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Did you hang him on the hook underneath the table? Yeah, hang him on the hook. Yeah, that would have been nice. Or did you just like set him down? No, right? we just like the beer. And put him on the, on the floor. floor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, like Pass Tatiana fire, came up and flew was out saying, into the sludge on the bar floor and stuff like that. Yeah. Like Tatiana yeah. came up to us and was like, "Oh, hey, so good to see you." And 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 she's like, "Oh, and congratulations on the baby!" Like, yeah, I, I'd like to see him. And we're like, uh, yeah, "Yeah, he's right there, right there." Right there. He's been right over, at yeah. your feet. Yeah, yeah. You just kicked him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nice. Cool. Ah, uh, that's great. All right, it's fun stuff. We're almost there. I'm at one yeah. percent. We could almost, we can almost take it all away. Sure, just, just ride it out. I've never had. I, I've never bring a power cord in because no guest has ever taken it this far, all from a hundred percent down. It's kind of embarrassing. Be honest. That's good. We just need to like hang out more. That's what it means. Like talked and talked and talked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. All right, cool, man. man. Well, thank you again. It yeah. Was, thank it you. Was a, it was an honor. This is a, a really fun one. So, thanks.